Imagine that you had lived your life in a golden cage. They called you a king, but you were, in fact, a pawn. You were a prisoner of someone else's plans, ambitions, and megalomania. And then a terrible army approached your country. It was very nearly at your border, and you had to make a choice. You could remain a pawn, or perhaps you could risk everything to finally become a king. This was the choice of King Michael I of Romania in the summer of 1944, and the choice that he would make would change the map of Europe for decades, open the door to a devastating political betrayal of the Romanian people by the United States and the United Kingdom, and reveal to us, in our own time, just why grand bargains with the Kremlin are never as grand as they might first appear to be. This incredible story of freedom is about the choice of King Michael I of Romania, communism's last king. Michael's father was a fellow named Carol. We'll know him soon enough as Carol II. He was a craven, grasping wastrel. He spent most of his youth gallivanting throughout Europe and doing everything in his power to burnish his reputation as the Playboy Prince of Romania. The name was very well deserved. As crown prince, Carol was more likely to be seen in the casinos of France or out on a shopping spree in London rather than tending to his royal duties back home in Romania. Carol was the quintessential example of a spoiled monarch. And after one brief and failed marriage, he was very quickly matched up with a new wife who would prove to be the exact opposite of him in personality, training, and disposition. At the time of their marriage, she was known as the Princess Helen of Greece. This was a match made in hell. But, at least initially, it got off to a pretty good start. Soon after their marriage, in 1921, the Princess Helen of Greece gave birth to her beloved son, Michael. And as the son of both Carol and Helen, Michael could claim an incredible family lineage. He was the great-great-grandson of both Queen Victoria of England and the famed German Emperor Wilhelm I, and he could also count most of the royal houses of Europe as members of his extended family tree. But as a husband and new father, Carol quickly reverted back to his old games. He was taking trips abroad again, this time with a new mistress. And very soon, the playboy prince agreed to divorce the queen mother, Helen, and give up his place in line for the throne. Michael would now become the crown prince, the next in line for the throne. And in 1927, at the age of six, that's exactly what happened. He became the very young boy king of Romania. And with his coronation came this topsy-turvy period of succession and regency and political instability in Romania. It was too much of an opportunity for Carol, Michael's father, to resist. He swooped in and replaced Michael with himself as the king of Romania. Michael once again became crown prince and the next in line. And from there, Michael would spend his youth in the glittering gem of Europe, the city that we know as Bucharest. The elites in Bucharest at the time, people that Michael would have known growing up, they reveled in their Art Nouveau Paris of the East. They imported the latest fashions from Western Europe. They read Nietzsche. They argued about politics in French and English and Romanian. They dined like gods and they preened themselves for public display in opulent and fantastic venues like the Athenium Concert Hall. It was a perfumed, glittering world, but it was not going to last. 
Throughout this very same period, the terrible currents of anti-Semitic politics were filling the streets of Bucharest, much as they were in other capitals like Vienna and Berlin. And it was at this point the horrific allure of National Socialism that Germany was building nearby, well, it was intoxicating to Michael's father, King Carol II of Romania. Unfortunately for the Playboy King, he had competition, and that took the form of Romania's new anti-Semitic dictator, a fellow named Ion Antonescu. The Antonescu as he liked to call himself. That's right, the dictator of Romania referred to himself as the Antonescu. And as far as the Antonescu was concerned, Romania wasn't big enough for both him and King Carol. So the dictator had the Playboy King removed from the throne. And in his place, he put Michael back on the throne again. In 1940, just as World War II was breaking out all across the continent, Michael was once more coronated, and he took the oath of king. He became, for the second time, King Michael I of Romania. And the dictator Antonescu promptly ensured that Michael was essentially stripped of all of his power and kept under effective house arrest with his mother, now the Queen Mother, Helen of Greece. When Germany launched Operation Barbarossa in 1941, Romanian forces joined with Germany in this fatalistic plunge into the endless expanse of the East. Romanian forces reached as far as the gates of Stalingrad before the tide of war turned and the Red Army began its long and brutal march back to the West. And then came 1944. German and other Axis armies were limping back from the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Red Army was fast approaching Romania's frontier. Michael, his counselors, and the Queen Mother, Helen, they were fully aware of what Joseph Stalin's Red Army would do to Romania if and when it invaded the country. The Antonescu had sided with the Axis. Romania was the enemy of the Soviet Union. It was the enemy of America and the Allies. And the Soviet steamroller was poised to ravage Michael's country, just as it would do to all other Axis states. Aside from the Antonescu, King Michael was perhaps the only figure at the time in Romania who had enough clout and political weight to rally others to his banner. And if he was going to take action to save his country from the destruction that would surely come with the arrival of the Red Army, Michael needed to act now. It would be his mother, the Queen Mother, Helen of Greece, who eventually presented Michael with the defining choice of his life. With the Red Army approaching, she told her son, you can either become known as Michael the Horrible and do nothing, or you can become king. Michael made his choice. The pawn would become a king. It was at this point that Romania's young and untested king launched a brazen conspiracy to take his country back and turn the tables on German political and military forces in Berlin. As a first step, Michael began to slip Axis secrets to the Americans. This was a way of demonstrating his good faith and aiding the Allies, even as his country was, for now, still an official enemy of Washington, London, and Moscow. Michael's conspiracy? Well, it may have started small, but very quickly after making contact with the Americans, it began to balloon and grow ever larger. Soon, Michael was engaged in regular clandestine communication with Washington, and then, using very carefully crafted language and under the utmost secrecy, 
Michael proposed to Washington that Romania would be willing to switch sides in the war, and perhaps even shorten the conflict, if there was enough political support from the Allies in the West. For their part, U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull and American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, well, they were extremely receptive to Michael's offer. They answered yes to his clandestine inquiry. But part of their secret communication, their secret response back to Michael, was confusing to the young king. Most importantly, Michael could not understand why the Americans were so insistent that he expand his conspiracy to include Romania's communist leaders. Through his secret channel, Michael attempted to explain to the Americans that inviting communists into his closest council was a very bad idea. Why didn't the Americans understand that, once he accepted members of the communist underground into his effort, it would be very hard to get rid of them? Why were the Americans so naive? Sadly, it was Michael who was naive about the Americans. Sure, Washington and London counted Moscow as an ally. And yeah, the United States had sent mountains of equipment to the USSR under the famed Lend-Lease program. But there was something deeper, something more insidious going on here. Winston Churchill had made a secret deal with Joseph Stalin to trade the country of Romania for Greece after the war. Under the terms of this bargain with Stalin, Churchill would essentially consign the entire population of Romania to live under communism. And in exchange, Stalin made an empty promise not to try and turn Greece into a communist country. It was a grand bargain of the worst kind with Moscow. As with all grand bargains with Moscow, this one was not nearly as grand nor inexpensive as Churchill first thought it to be. Unfortunately for Michael, he knew nothing about the deal that Churchill had cut with Stalin, and the Americans were more than happy just to go along with Churchill's guidance. Michael, believing that the Allies were acting in good faith, he accepted their recommendation. He believed that there must be a legitimate reason why the Western democracies would want him to bring communists into his plan. But that's what Washington said, so that's what Michael would do. This was one of the darkest moments in American and British foreign policy history. King Michael was unaware that the Western powers had already sealed the fate of his country. But Michael was still resolved to act in good faith unlike Washington or London. That's why in August 1944, with the Red Army now poised for its big push into Romania, the pawn would truly become a king. Leaving behind his mother and their mountain retreat at the Pelish Castle, Michael hurried by car to Bucharest. It was the beginning of the coup, his coup, that would surprise the world. There, now in Bucharest, in the royal palace, in the center of the capital, Michael and the dictator, Ion Antonescu, had a face-to-face -face meeting. Officially, Antonescu was there to provide an update to Michael on the state of the war, and here we can almost see Michael hesitate. For over an hour, he inquired about not only the state of the war, but the likelihood that Antonescu could negotiate a separate peace and prevent the Red Army from invading Romania. Arrogant and stubborn as ever, Antonescu offered some excuses and reasons why his negotiations weren't going so well. Then we can see Michael, perhaps, gaining his courage and steeling himself for the moment of truth. It was after an hour of this back and forth with V. Antonescu that Michael finally issued the prearranged phrase that phrase which would initiate his revolt. Well, there is nothing left for us to do, he said. 
With that, that code phrase, suddenly the guards who were officially there to protect the dictator Antonescu turned on him and seized the Antonescu. They restrained the dictator and locked him in the room that Michael's father had once used to store his stamp collection. Imagine the shock of V. Antonescu, a man who had spent years grasping for power and, for a very brief time, he held on to it, only to be undone by someone he least expected, by his pawn, his prisoner in a golden cage. Acting with great haste, members of his coup spread throughout the city. They took control of key points around the capital and arrested the German secret police who had been stationed there in the country. This act was especially important because, at that moment, even though the war was essentially lost, Germany was still attempting to transport Romania's Jews to meet their end in the Holocaust. Thousands of lives would be saved as a result of Michael's coup. Seeing this sudden reversal of fortune, Romania's army quickly flocked to the banner of their king. They turned their guns on the retreating German forces who were left in the country and took 50,000 German generals, officers, and soldiers captive, denying Berlin of precious soldiers that it would need later in the war for a last great stand in the German heartland. This was a coup de grace of the highest caliber, and this coup by Michael sent shockwaves around the world. However, with his coup, we must also consider that Michael would be very grumpy that I'm even calling it a coup in the first place, as he would say for the remainder of his life, I don't make coups. I was head of state. Okay, sure, perhaps, but here I think Michael was selling himself short. His coup de grace against the anti-Semitic Axis government in Romania, and ultimately Axis powers in general, stunned the world. And it also created a very big problem for Joseph Stalin. You see, Romania had just joined the Allies. Instead of arriving into an enemy country and pillaging and looting it as the Red Army saw fit, now Soviet forces were arriving into friendly territory. The country of Romania was now an official friend of the Soviet Union. Michael was too popular to kill or topple by force once Moscow installed a communist government in Bucharest. On account of his revolt, Michael was now the reigning monarch and head of state of a communist country. Communism didn't have kings, yet there was Michael still on the throne. Something had to be done about King Michael. This could not stand. Eventually, after a brief show trial and execution of V. Antonescu in 1946, it was Michael's turn to go. By 1947, the Kremlin's commissars resolved to oust the king of their communist country once and for all. They presented the king with an evil, impossible choice. Michael could either resign as king and leave the country, or the new communist regime would execute 1,000 Romanian students in retaliation. Welcome to the workers' paradise. Michael was not one to cling on to power, and he could not stay on the throne at the price of his own people dying at the hands of Moscow's puppets there in Bucharest. So Michael chose to let others live at the cost of his crown. The communist government then immediately stripped Michael of his royal possessions and his Romanian citizenship. They forced him to leave the country, together with his mother, Helen. At the train station in Bucharest, as citizens of no country, King Michael and the Queen Mother Helen said their farewells to a few friends who had gathered to come see them off, and then they boarded a train to exile and the unknown. Now, the story of King Michael, communism's last king, and his mother, Helen, well, it wouldn't just end there on a platform in Bucharest. 
Years later, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center would posthumously add the name of Michael's mother and conscience and guide, the Queen Mother Helen of Greece, to the list of righteous among the nations. She too would be made Yad Vashem for her work in attempting to save the lives of Romania's Jews during the Holocaust. And King Michael? Well, he would go on to marry the love of his life, Princess Anne of Bourbon Parma. Together, they would have five daughters and raise them in Switzerland. President Harry Truman would eventually award Michael the prestigious Legion of Merit for his wartime service to the Allies. But when we step back and look at what this award meant, in reality, America was thanking Michael for handing the country of Romania over to communism. It was a dark moment in our past, one that we should never forget or repeat. But Michael's story just doesn't end there. It doesn't end with the bittersweet loss of his country and crown to communism. You see, after the Iron Curtain fell in 1989, Michael wanted to return to his home. The fledgling post-communist government in Bucharest, well, they didn't want him to return back to the country, and they told him as much. So, Michael slipped back, very quietly, into his country so that he could celebrate Easter Mass for the first time in a country that was freed from communism. While in Bucharest, word spread very quickly about the return of the king, and Michael encountered crowds of supporters who cheered his return. Even if many Romanians did not want to return the monarchy now that they had just thrown off the shackles of communism, they still recognized the self-sacrifice and patriotism and duty that Michael demonstrated in the final act of World War II. And when Romanians finally elected their first truly democratic government after 1989, its new leaders opened the country's doors to their deposed and exiled king. They restored his citizenship, but not his crown, and they showered him with honors. Michael was even able to return to his beloved home in the mountains, Pelish Castle. That was the same home from which he launched his world-changing coup so many years ago, when the pawn had become a king. And upon his death in 2017, the funeral in Romania for King Michael I was one of the most spectacular in European history up until that point in the 21st century. Monarchs from all around the world, including many of Michael's relatives, relatives like Prince Charles, now King Charles of England, came to pay their respects. And together, with the people of Romania, they mourned and remembered and honored the life and legacy and tremendous courage of King Michael I, communism's last king. Now, do you love freedom and fellowship and learning more about the story behind the events that have shaped our world? Well, if you do, show us just how much you love freedom by subscribing and leaving a comment. That will really help bootstrap the algorithm for us. And every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock Eastern, I hope you join us over at Locals. You can see the link below in the description where we talk about the latest episode. And I'd be very interested to hear more of what your favorite stories of freedom are. Who knows? Maybe it might be featured in a future episode. <laughs>